Welcome to our Christmas Eve service. Albeit a very different service that one, many of us imagined or hoped that we'd be able to celebrate this Christmas. But with the increasing numbers of COVID, especially here on the island, restrictions are now in place that makes it so that we can't meet like we want to. And we want to do our part to try to curb the cases. So here we meet via the web. Here we meet via the video. Yet we know that God is with us wherever we worship. So let us take time now to celebrate Christ's birth on this Christmas Eve. Before we worship, we recognize that we're gathered on the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And we begin this evening's worship by lighting the Christ candle. Throughout Advent, we've been lighting the four different candles of hope, peace, joy, and love. And tonight, we light the white candle, the Christ candle, as we celebrate Christ coming to this world as a baby in the manger. God has come into the world. Glory to God in the highest. This is the good news for all people. To us is born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And the world is transformed. And things cannot remain the same. It is made new in hope and peace and joy and in love. Let us pray. Source of light, shine in our lives and in your world with your transforming power. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let us come before God and let us worship. In this silent night, we ponder your mystery with Mary and Joseph. On this holy night, we come with the shepherds to worship. On this night of joy for the world, we sing praises with choirs of angels. In the darkness of this night, we celebrate the light of the world. Let us come before God and let us pray. God of mystery and of wonder, on this holy night, the angels sing your praises with great joy. Glory to you, O God, the shepherds welcome your saving love, born in a manger. Glory to you, O God, 
Mary and Joseph ponder your promise cradled in their arms. Glory to you, O God, so we come to praise you singing with the angels, amazed with the shepherds, cradling the Christ child in our hearts. Glory to you, O God, source of light and love for all people. God of grace and mercy, you give us the greatest gift of all, your Son, Jesus. But we confess we get caught up in our own gift-giving on this holy night. You offer us new life in the babe of Bethlehem, but we smile at the baby and forget the new direction he offers. Jesus was born in human flesh, but we fail to see the dignity in the human lives around us. Forgive us, O God, and help us cherish the meaning in your gifts of wonder in the Christ child. Amen. Friends, the angels brought glad tidings that first Christmas night. Their words still echo through the ages. Do not be afraid. This very night, a Savior is born for all of us in this hurting world. Accept the forgiveness that the Christ child brings for you and rejoice with the angels. We begin our Christmas story from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, reading the first seven verses. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This evening, I'm going to read a, a small reading, a chapter from Twin. It's called Twins in a Manger. It's from Christmas in All Seasons by Geneva Butts who is a pastor, and so she's sharing stories of her ministries. Twins. Twins in a manger. Can you imagine that? It's not part of the traditional Christmas story, but that's what we had one Christmas Eve. Each year, God has faithfully given us a baby for our Christmas manger. If we have a boy, then Christ is a boy. If we have a girl, Christ's a girl. If we have an African-American child, then Christ is an African-American, or German-American, or Hispanic. This year, God has been especially generous and has given us twins. The doctor's announcement that there would be two babies caused quite a stir in Barry and Jean's household. They already had one daughter, Carrie, now age five. Another child would have been great, but two? Barry and Jean weren't sure they could handle two babies at the same time. In August, the twins were born, and they are both doing very well. Their parents are adjusting, and it's been a special joy to have the grandparents of the babies in the congregation, too. It's a privilege to see the thrill and delight of two generations as they marvel at what God has done. Both babies were with us on Christmas Eve. Together, they are a sign of God's extraordinary generosity. It, would have been, sorry, it wouldn't have been fair to select only one of them to be Jesus. So Jenna was baby Jesus outdoors at the 6.30 p.m. service, and Jessica was Jesus indoors at the 7.30 p.m. candlelight service. Few people noticed that the babies were different because they're identical. As I thought about these twins, I remembered the Old Testament twins, Jacob, Jacob and Esau, whose story is recorded in the book of Genesis. They were not identical twins. In fact, they were as different as day and night. They fought each other and struggled over who was to receive their father's blessing and the family inheritance. As twin stories go, it's not a pleasant one. 
Stories filled with struggle and deceit, animosity and rivalry. I tried to imagine what twins in our manger would be like. Would they get along with each other? Or would they be rivals? If Jesus has had a twin, would the ill will we see in Jacob and Esau be theirs as well? Somehow it seems in keeping with the Prince of Peace tradition to have two babies in the manger who would be able to get along and show the whole world what true reconciliation is all about. How might such an apocryphal story develop? I tried to envision the visit of the Magi and the flight into Egypt with twins. Perhaps Mary and Joseph might have decided to leave one of the babies in Egypt with the family who had welcomed them in order, in order to ensure the survival of at least one child during the slaughter of the innocent children. I can even imagine an ending to the story. The twins reunited years later as Jesus is headed to Jerusalem to face the cross. In the midst of my Advent musings about twins, a visiting German New Testament theologian arrived to spend a few days at my home. And when I told him about my speculation over twins in the manger, he said, that's not such a far-fetched idea. And then he told me about the twin tradition in the early church, as recorded in the Gospel of Thomas. According to this non-canonical Gnostic text, the disciple Thomas, whose name means twin, taught that people who became followers of Jesus take on a new identity. Through baptism, they become part of a new community in which, as they share the characteristics of Christ, they become Jesus' own brothers and sisters. Later, as recorded in the Gnostic writing Acts of Thomas, we learn that the disciple Thomas traveled to India, where he preached and taught, healed the sick, and performed miracles, just as Jesus had done. And sometimes people mistook this disciple, this twin, for Jesus, saying he has the same face, the same expression. He looks just like Jesus. In this way, we can begin to understand the words of the Apostle Paul, who wrote during the same formative period of the early church, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So having twins in the manger is not a foolish idea, like I'd first imagined. We become Jesus' twin as we live the life that he taught. Like Paul and Thomas, we put on Christ when we are baptized. And the purpose of the Christian life is to be transformed so that, the way, so that we may be conformed to the image and the likeness of God's own child. God became one of us so we might become like God and find our way back to God. Christ is the firstborn within a large family in which we also have a part. Twins. Twins in the manger. Twins in our Christmas creche. While one twin is up front, visible for all to see, the other twin is hidden in the congregation among the great body of believers. Perhaps we who come to the creche on Christmas Eve, the most holy of nights, come to rediscover and reclaim our own true identity as twins of Jesus. We continue our Christmas story in the Gospel of Luke. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors.
Our next reading is uh, from the book In the Manger by Max Lucado. It's God Dances Amid the Common, which is based around the text we just read. There is one word that describes the night he came. Ordinary. The sky was ordinary. An occasional gust stirred the leaves and chilled the air. The stars were diamonds sparkling on black velvet. Fleets of clouds floated in front of the moon. It was a beautiful night. A night worth peeking out your bedroom window to admire. But not really an unusual one. Nothing to keep a person awake. An ordinary night with an ordinary sky. The sheep were ordinary. Some fat. Some scrawny, some with barrel bellies, some with twig legs. Common animals. No fleece made of gold. No blue ribbon winners. They were simply sheep. Lumpy, sleeping silhouettes on a hillside. And the shepherds, peasants they were, probably wearing all the clothes that they owned, smelling like sheep and looking just as woolly. They were conscientious, willing to spend the night with their flocks. But you won't find their staffs in a museum or their writings in a library. No one asked their opinion on social justice or the application of the Torah. They were nameless and simple. An ordinary night with ordinary sheep and ordinary shepherds. And were it not for a God who loves to hook an extra on the front of the ordinary, the night would have gone unnoticed. The sheep and shepherds would have been forgotten. But God dances amid the common, and that night he did a waltz. The black sky exploded with brightness. Trees that had been shadows jumped into clarity. Sheep that had been silent became a chorus of curiosity. One minute the shepherd was dead asleep. The next he was rubbing his eyes and staring into the face of an alien. The night was ordinary. No more. The announcement went first to the shepherds. They didn't ask God if he was sure he knew what he was doing. Had the angel gone to the theologians, they would have first consulted their commentaries. Had he gone to the elite, they would have looked around to see if anyone was watching. Had he gone to the successful, they would have first looked to their calendars. So the angels went to the shepherds. Men who didn't have a reputation to protect or an axe to grind or a ladder to climb. Men who didn't know enough to tell God that angels don't sing to sheep and the messiahs aren't found sleeping in a feed trough. The angels came in the night because that is when lights are best seen and that is when they are most needed. God comes into the common for the same reason. His most powerful tools are the simplest. We continue our story in Luke. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what he had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. We continue from Max's book in reading Seeing Jesus. God invites us to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Heaven invites you to set the lens on your heart of the Savior and make him the object of your life. But what does it mean to see Jesus? The shepherds can tell us. For them, it wasn't enough to see the angels. You'd think it would have been. Night sky shattered with light. Stillness erupting with song. Simple shepherds roused from their sleep and raised to their feet by an angel choir. Glory to God in the highest. Never had these men seen such splendor. But it wasn't enough. 
to see the angels. The shepherds wanted to see the one who sent the angels. Since they wouldn't be satisfied until they saw him, you can trace the long line of Jesus seekers to a person who said, let's go, let's see. Not far behind the shepherds was a man named Simeon. And Luke tells us Simeon was a good man who served in the temple during the time of Christ's birth. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen Lord Christ. This prophecy was fulfilled only a few days after the shepherds saw Jesus. Somehow Simeon knew that the blanketed bundle that he saw in Mary's arms was the Almighty God. And for Simeon, seeing Jesus was enough. Now he was ready to die. Some don't want to die until they've seen the world. Simeon's dream was not so timid. He didn't want to die until he had seen the maker of the world. He had to see Jesus. He prayed, God, you can now release your servant. Release me in peace as you promised. With my own eyes, I've seen your salvation. The Magi had the same desire. They wanted to see Jesus. Like the shepherds, they were not satisfied with the spectacular star that they saw in the night sky. To be a witness of the blazing orb was a privilege. But for the Magi, it wasn't enough to see the light over Bethlehem. They wanted to see the light of Bethlehem. It was him that they'd come to see. And they succeeded. They all succeeded. More remarkable than their diligence was Jesus' willingness. Jesus wants to be seen. They were all welcomed. Search for one example of one person who desired to see the infant Jesus and was turned away. You won't find it. I wonder if you would be willing to do the same. What matters is that you want to know Jesus since God rewards those who truly want to find him. He welcomes you to come and see him today. Now we turn to the Gospel of Matthew as we continue our story. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. And when King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage." And when they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Throughout Advent, we've uh, been doing our own journey of the wise men. It was based on the book of the Manger Mission, where we see the wise men moving a tradition of children in, a, in their home, moving the wise men from their nativity scene closer and closer to the manger to be there for Christmas Eve. So tonight, we continue that journey, as some of our congregation members have shared. So we here have them close to their destination. Here in a peaceful village. The kid's tree in the upstairs rec room. What a great place to be. Here they are, early to their goal. 
And here we have, we decided safety in numbers was smart. Look at the size of these strange animals in this strange country. How about baby, it's cold out there. We're enjoying a musical interlude. And probably my favorite as this was going around is social distancing as they come to the manger and see the child. And when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I'd like to thank everyone who has taken part through at Advent and including this evening. I hope you had a great time with it. And those who didn't send them in, I hope you had uh, a good time with that as well, reflecting on the journey of the wise men. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. God's gift in the Christ child arrived in a small town, a humble stable, to a couple no one invited in. And still that gift changes lives. Our gifts to God this Christmas share in that miracle. And just because we are not together in the sanctuary doesn't mean that we can't still offer God our gifts, whether it's gifts of prayer or hospitality and helping others, or even including monetary gifts. Let us pray. Generous and loving God, your gift to us in Christ Jesus still draws us to a manger and opens our hearts with wonder. Lord, bless our gifts in his name so that they may draw others to your love and the blessing we have found in the one born for us. Amen. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, amidst all the uncertainty, amidst the turmoil, amidst the fear and anxiety that this pandemic has brought, we pause to give you thanks. We pause to remember Jesus Christ coming to this world in the form of a baby, your promised Messiah. And we place our faith, we place our hope, our trust in him. In our times of joy, in our times of sorrow, in our times of anxiety, in our times of fear, Lord, may we turn to you, knowing that your son came to this world and experienced all these things. And you have the power to lift them up. Lord, may we lean on Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. May you be filled with the wonder of Mary, the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, and the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the Magi, and the peace of the Christ child. And go from this place with the blessing of our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ our Messiah, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. I wish you a very blessed Merry Christmas, wherever you are celebrating, whoever you're celebrating with. Remember that even if we're not together, we have the technology that can bring us together, and we are thankful for that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is born.